we come back and figure out how to make it affordable and accessible to any kid. Uh, and maybe uh, admissions is already getting started this year. Over half of our applicants are from the city. This is the fastest growing contingent uh, of, of applicants. I think that um, the word is starting to get out here in our, you know, in your neighborhoods that there's a school for, for a certain kind of kid that's, uh, that, that's making a big difference. So let me turn this over to Zachary to say a little bit about how we, I guess, how we imagine being a part of the community and what sort of, oh, yeah. But here, I'll spread it. Hey, please. Hey, everybody, and uh, welcome. I saw you just came in um, here. So I'm Zachary, and, and as Sam said, I lead on the humanities at the school, and I wanted to just talk a little bit about the impact that uh, we hope we will, we will have on the community. And by telling you a little bit about it, I think about the impact we've had or, or already a little bit on, on the community on the community um, and I just want to tell you about just a couple of programs that we run outside of the school so we were uh, as Sam mentioned uh, we're a school but we also run public events and these are very well attended public events we have math festivals um, we actually have one coming up in October it's a math festivals uh, a math festival for girls uh, and the idea there being that we want to address some of the um, underrepresentation of, of girls in math. And last year we ran this math festival and we had uh, about 85 girls come to our school on, on a Saturday morning at 10 a.m. It, it was a public, it's a free event. Um, we got sponsorships for it. We got some uh, people who are in math education outside of ourselves to help sponsor it. We passed out uh, books, resources, games, t-shirts to every single kid who came to the school that morning. And that's one of our central missions, is to make sure that we are communicating with the world and impacting positively our community. And so that, that, that's one, one aspect. We run math festivals. We also run a, a public math festival in the spring that's just open to the public. Boys and girls um, are welcome to come to that one. And again, we, we pass out. We have games and books and t-shirts that we give them. Um, uh, the other thing that we do is that we also run a, a, a professional development for math teachers um, all over, from all over the Bay Area. And in fact, one of our uh, co-founders and who is also on our, uh, who serves as the chair of our board, he runs this and he brings in, it's a free service to math teachers around the city um, from coming from Berkeley, Marin, from down south, wherever wherever they're coming from can come on, a, on different Saturdays. It's listed on our website now. I think there's seven or eight Saturdays they come and they learn uh, new methods of teaching math, new ways of uh, math enrichment, math games that they can use to, to reach their own kids out there. So uh, even if we are a, a, a school and we have a, a small school, uh, I won't overstate our, our, our impact or our footprint, but I hope that this gives you a sense that we might be a small school, but we are, we, we open our doors to the outside, we, we bring them in, we want them, we want math teachers to go back to their own school districts and, and teach math in a very exciting way as well. So that's our, I just wanted to mention some of that impact that we have and, and what we do as a, as a school. But and I think that that's, a, that's what I'll say. And, and I think we're gonna look a little bit at, the, at some of the design aspect. Okay. Next of the project. All right, okay, yeah. We're basically going on to Mission Street uh, 973. Uh, recently, the building adjacent to us, Cobalt, was renovated, and it's one of those uh, uh, shared spaces for different uh, uh, professionals to come together. So we'll be taking over the building right next to it. This is 981, if I'm not mistaken, we're 973. The key about the location is uh, the, the kids are coming to a, a urban center, and they have uh, no need for uh, cars. The idea is that they're using the mass transit that we have provided that, that's provided by the city. So you're not impacted, we're not adding traffic flows. Uh, very little uh, uh, bike use will come from this project because the kids, we don't want them to be on a bicycle in an urban setting. There might be a professor that might require a bike, so we don't have the amount of bar parking spaces that you guys were required for the parking on the, on the, on the Folsom project. But the idea is to revitalize this uh, uh, building that used to be the lucky spot. I don't know if you guys remember that location there, but. Uh, uh, this building has been vacant for quite some time. It's a building that's about 100 years old, so we had to do some major seismic retrofit and talk about working on the foundations and, uh, and, and 
enhancing the, the capabilities. This building now can support, in case of a major, major earthquake, a building adjacent to it. But because being an e-occupancy, we had to take this to a higher level of seismic uh, resisti uh, resistance. And uh, the, the key is, uh, it's taken some time, but it's a great building. Uh, it's a wonderful little space that uh, we're basically carving into it. As uh, Sam and Zach said, it's going to ultimate accommodate about 120 kids. It's a, basically a one-story building that has a basement, and we're carving out a portion of it with a mezzanine on the second level. Uh, the facade is pretty straight, uh, straightforward from what uh, the, the base architect has done. We are working with uh, another firm that is uh, representing the owner. We're representing the school. But basically, we do have a, a facade open to the, to the mission street. There will be some screening there for the kids to have some privacy. We're going to have an arrival point that has a small lobby, and then we have a classroom and, and, and room that can be used for, for gatherings. Uh, the floor plan, Nina will walk you through, but primarily it's two, two main levels with a small uh, uh, mezzanine. Uh. So, so we're looking at Mission Street uh, at the bottom and Mina Street at the top. Right to the side, you have Cobo Space and parking lot, and uh, current parking lot on the other side. So you walk into the lobby, we primarily have classrooms and small breakout space on the side, and the big activity space for multi-activities, and we have a small surgery and a small research center in the back. So like Jorge said, we have a basement and a mezzanine that also comprises a lot of breakout space, some science labs, some offices in the mezzanine, and more classrooms in the back. Um, proof of some unique uh, active learning experiences, so we have some of these spaces that will be very conducive for that different type of activities. The building has uh, currently two skylights that are being uh, uh, cleaned up and, and uh, modernized to provide light into the central space of it. One skylight is right over the stair that goes down into the basement and another one over the activity area. There's a little bit of aperture towards the, the Minna Street and my primarily is towards the, the North Street. The mechanical units are on the roof. It's all new equipment. So the owner really stepped up and, and uh, uh, the school also stepped up to really uh, bring a, an incredible new facility. It will withstand some major seismic activity. So, any questions? Oh, sorry, Sam would have. No, no, that's okay. Uh, okay, uh, I've just read in the papers, uh, or I should say on news, that they found this cuneiform tablet that showed ratios and how ca the how the uh, geometry w was uh, goes back more than a thousand years before they thought it did, that the Greeks, well, they weren't the first. And uh, so it's sort of like there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in math. And is some of, are you going to be teaching some of this stuff? Yeah, this is history and whatnot. This is the Plimpton tablet. This is a, a pretty famous uh, uh, tablet containing, kind of, it was a bit of a mystery for a while, triples of numbers. And like, what are these numbers, what are they for? And the hypothesis for was for a long time that that they were textbook, they were sort of a teacher's reference for making textbook exercises in solving quadratic equations. But not making this up. Uh, the most recent, the reason it's resurfaced in the news, as far as I understand it, is that there's been a rethinking of perhaps what the purpose of, of recording these triples of numbers was for. And there's a thought that maybe it's more so that by, uh, by making a triangles with different length sides that they're it's, they're making it possible to obtain all a nice range of, of angles. So if you need a 37 degree angle, then you go to, you use these three lengths to build your triangle. And if you need a 42 degree angle, well, you try using those. It, so they're rethinking maybe what the purpose of the towel is. But it's, it's a, this does capture the spirit of what we're trying to bring to our classroom, of course, is that, that a lot of math is a kind of mystery like this, and that if you present it to kids in a way that allows them to get excited, to investigate, to be surprised, to try to explain things. They discover they have the capability to do all those things. And, uh, and our kids really do thrive on this. There are certain kids that are wired to just lap this up. And bringing them together and, and providing them with, with this kind of thing to, to explore is, we're discovering it is a, is a powerful way to, um, to teach. Um, right down here in the park, 
We have uh, Central YMCA has a youth facility, and Columbia Boys and Girls Club has a youth facility, and they have a study center over on um, Jones Street at Turk Street. Um, have you thought about reaching out to them to um, uh, encourage their youth to become involved in programs like you have? Yes, or to interact yeah. with them on events using Boat Anchor Park, which really nice park. This is a, a terrific idea, and it fits in. It fits into the mission of the school. One of the things we want our kids to to experience is is turning around and sharing a little bit of what they know and have with with the people right around them, and and those sorts of. Uh, these centers that you're describing seem like a perfect outlet for that sort of activity, especially when we turn to our. So there's a there's a community service component to our, you know, to our high school grades, and one of the things that we looked at once we have more juniors and seniors. Like I said, we're a fairly young school still, mainly middle and ninth and tenth grade um, students. The what we'd like to see some of our juniors and seniors do is is plan lessons, plan little mass circle activities. And then, and then take them out as part of a, a like part of a, a, a public service component. Say. So, um, so thank you for mentioning those. I, I, let me make sure I jot down the names of these before I go today. Um, as far as the design, um, you talk about breakout. What's a breakout? Uh, hmm. what, what's the function of the breakout? Right, here, yeah, right. let me. Uh, I'll explain. So. Uh, probably the best way to understand it is that in a traditional class environment, the teacher gets up and talks. And the students will write down notes, and then the end of the class happens, and they go to the next class. And what, 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 for, for us, the way we like to teach is that we'll start with a, with a small idea, with a little idea for students to think about. And then we have them break out into small groups to try to figure out what's going on with that on their own. What we want to do as teachers, in other words, is not to be the kind of the wise person on the stage giving all the information, but showing students interesting ideas and problems that they can then try to figure out on their own. And so the way we use these kind of breakout spaces, what you're seeing is that if you are in the science labs downstairs, or even these classrooms on the in the in the middle on the on the main floor, to use that activity space so that students can can go out of the classroom, of that, of that classroom to work in small groups to try to figure out a solution to a problem or an answer to a, to a question. And then we'll bring them back into the classroom to discuss what they discovered or what they thought. And if you were to map out the movement of our, of our classes in, in a 90 minute class, students will start in the classroom, move outside the classroom in small groups, come back together, discuss, and then go back out again in small groups. We really like to make sure that the kids are kind of owners of, of their learning and, and whatnot. And by we, that's how we're going to use these spaces that are out there. So uh, we actually need more space than just a classroom in order to, to teach like this. That's a lot of what um, a lot of what our our Tenderloin uh, uh, homeless convention, Tenderloin uh, residents convention do down here for the adults down in our neighborhood. They get together for half an hour and talk. That everybody breaks up and takes subjects within the neighborhood. Um, so it's a good business model because we're, we use it down in the neighborhood all the time. It's turning out to be a great learning model as well. Now, one question I have, of course, is that um, I know because I have an earlier project receiving environmental review. Yep. Um, and so, what's the plan on this? What, what's your timeline on this? So currently we're undergoing our education study and we are hoping to wrap everything by So we're proposing the pickup drop off area in front of the building and I'm not sure if that's just the way that we're in the process. I'm, perhaps I'll add to that because I think a, 
I think a natural question on the minds of people in a, in a community when a school arrives is, am I going to be able to get out my front door, you know, at, at 8.30 in the morning, or is it going to be turned into a zoo? And one of the things that is happening in Proof School now, because kids come from such a wide range, uh, literally, literally 85 to 90 percent of our students are coming to school via public transportation combined with walking up to the to the school building in chaperone groups. That's that's what's happened this morning for the kids to, for the 78 kids to get to school and what happened again on their way home. So that the number of drop-offs, even and this is part of the, the environmental review is is projecting what's the um, what kind of, of, of vehicular traffic will will this lead to in front of the school? And and based on having 80 students now, when we when we just extrapolate to 120 students, we're anticipating in the neighborhood of, of 15 vehicles for a drop off over the course of a 45 minute drop off period. And those those are uh, what we are we're not dressing up numbers for you. We're simply taking here's here are the number of vehicles that come now. It's about 10. We're expecting to be 50 percent larger. That translates to about 15 vehicles, like I said, spread out between 8.30 and 9.15 as the kids come in. We'll set up a staggered drop-off so that there are never more than seven vehicles at any time. We, the bottom line is we're very proud of our kids for coming as far as they do and for learning to navigate the city on foot and via public transportation. And it's something that, that will continue to happen. We have no plans of... We, we are we're proud of being a, um, a, a, a school that has a very small carbon footprint in that respect. And it's something that, uh, that's become a, a, a part of our, um, kind of a, a part of our culture. Um, have you worked, or are you working with Muni to coordinate with the Mission District transit system for students using the Mission Bus? Because that's a very crowded bus in the morning for all the people coming from uh, uh, further out in the system in downtown. Yeah, so most of our kids that are using the Muni buses, um, they're, they're using Muni buses in the afternoon to go back down to Caltrain. That's where we use with the, the bus. Otherwise, they're coming from Berkeley and taking BART right into Powell Street, walking up. Um, the kids who are coming from San Francisco are using uh, using Muni and they're, they're all the kids are meeting chaperones. We have chaperones that, that work with this. They meet them at Powell Street as well. And currently, they're walking up to our current location. And we're going to be even closer to Powell Street at the new location. So we don't have a, a, a very big impact on, on those bus lines because uh, the kids aren't coming from one particular neighborhood. There, there's a couple of kids coming from various neighborhoods all across the, the Bay Area. And that's where we add up to our, our current numbers. Uh, I, yeah, the, board, the mission worries me when it gets to start getting kids on the transit because it is a dangerous line to ride, to ride on. And um, I, whenever I hear kids in Muni, I get very nervous. Um, so it's, it's just something that working in public safety as I've done it for 30 years um, is something that I worry about. And the, I will say that this is a was before we opened up and still continues to be one of our biggest um, one of our one of the things we focus on most is uh, student safety especially on the transportation system so I don't know if we quite articulate we have kids coming from San Jose and from Pleasanton and from Marin and Berkeley and Orinda and they're all taking public transportation in um, and so we, we, we developed a, an app on our, on, on our phones that we can use that we can track students as they're coming in, and we track them as they come into the school, and the same thing when they're going back out. Um, but I do hear what you're saying about the safety, like once they're on those, once they're on those, those routes. Um, it's been a remarkably pretty smooth so far, and I'll knock on some proverbial wood right now with that. Um, and, uh, and, and the kids are really fantastic at, at we, we teach them public safety. We teach them to be aware of themselves, their surroundings. We teach them to keep their heads up, looking around. Um, we're about to have our annual safety training uh, uh, this Friday, in fact. So 
That's coming right up. Um, something you may want to do as another organization to look into to get help from is an organization with the police department called Safety Awareness for Everyone.